Our amazing exhibition, I Am a Man. We have with us today our guest curator, Dr. Bill Ferris, and we have with us another wonderful guest, which is Katie Blunt. And we're going to dive deep into this exhibition called I Am a Man. It is so great. If you haven't seen it, you must come down. We had a couple of snafus that happened the last time. And so we're going to, again, dig really deep. And with that, I'm going to introduce you to Katie Blunt, who's our Executive Director of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Thank you, Pam, and thank you, Bill, for being with us again today. Uh, and thank you to our, uh, our viewers. We're glad you're here with us. Um, when we had this conversation earlier, Bill and, and Pam, uh, Pam gave a, a full introduction to, to Bill, um, of Bill, talking about his illustrious career and I'm gonna do something a little bit different today. Of course, you all probably know he's a native of Vicksburg, Mississippi, grew up on a farm near there. Um, started very young, documenting our rich culture in Mississippi. Founded the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi, where I was a student. Um, went on to be chairman of the National Endowment of the Humanities, and has spent uh, his recent years uh, on the faculty at the University of North Carolina. But what I want to talk about today, because I think it's really interesting and I want you all to know about it, is Bill's incredible impact on the Department of Archives and History. Um, this agency was established in 1902, uh, essentially to promote the stories of the lost cause, um, you know, the, the glories of the Confederacy. Uh, and today we proudly operate the two Mississippi museums, the Museum of Mississippi History and the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. Uh, both of which tell our stories with great candor, all of our stories, even the most difficult one. So obviously this agency made a significant evolution over the last century. And it took place gradually, uh, but there are a few key turning points, and here's one. Uh, in the late 1960s, the legendary director of the agency, Charlotte Capers, who was the first female director of a Mississippi state agency, hired Patty Carr Black, another legend, uh, to develop exhibits at the Old Capitol, which was then the State History Museum. And not long after she started, uh, Patty had a cup of coffee with a young Mississippi folklorist named Bill Ferris. Uh, in an oral history interview conducted by Larry Morrissey in 2010, Patty talked about that meeting. She said, I was absolutely smitten with his insights on the folk art and folklore available in the state. Growing up in the Delta, I was aware of blues, certainly black gospel music, of course, but he was into everything. Architecture, music, crafts, everything. And a light bulb just went on, and that's what I wanted to do with the Old Capitol Museum, to be a showcase of our culture instead of the emphasis that had been on war and politics and statesmen, which is a legitimate interest but much too narrow for a state as rich in culture as this. That conversation changed the way Patty understood the role of the state historical agency and of the museums. And from that moment, still collaborating frequently with Bill, she greatly <laughs> expanded our role, our audience, and our impact. Um, if you walk around the, the two Mississippi museums today and all of our museums, you'll see the legacy of the work that Bill and Patty did together. The exhibits are rich with art, uh, music, quilts, pottery, baskets, and most importantly, the voices of the people of Mississippi. Um, but you'll see a far greater emphasis on um, stories not covered initially in the department's work. Uh, uh, the experience, or, or black history, the experience of, of black Mississippians, uh, the Native American experience. Uh, you'll see a, an honest exploration of the variety of our culture and the complexity of our history. Um, and, and again, that is, that is Bill's legacy and Patty's and, and that of many, many other people. And that's why it's such an honor for us uh, to premiere I'm a Man, uh, the, the American premiere of I'm a Man, uh, which is an extraordinary exhibit of civil rights photographs that, that Bill curated. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Pam, and we'll talk about some of those extraordinary photographs. Well, well, before we do that, Bill, if you'll talk about 
this, this young lady right here as a student yeah. at the University of Mississippi. This is not in the script, Pam. <laughs> well, Katie is someone that I could talk a long time about. I, we first met, I believe, in Washington, D.C. or Maryland right. when I was DC. at a program and she indicated she was interested in study of the South and folklore. And I said, well, come to the University of Mississippi and do an MA. And she did, where she was a star. And then she was hired uh, to work at the archives. And she worked her way up. And to my delight, she was named uh, as the director of the Department of Archives and History. And I have sort of followed her at a distance. I don't keep up in a close way, but then I learned about the two Mississippi museums, the vision of Katie and her team, including you, Pam, uh, of those two museums and the team, including my dear friend, Governor Winter, uh, Merle Evers, who grew up in my hometown of Vicksburg. Uh, it's just a dream. And I could never have imagined uh, what you all have done and the ability to simply call Katie and say, Katie, we have this exhibit of civil rights photography. Would that fit in? She said, absolutely. And here we are today. So I'm just deeply grateful to both of you for the leadership you bring, not just the state of Mississippi, but our nation. Uh, it makes me feel very, very special to be on a program with both of you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, thank you. You know, I know that the last time we, we talked, and we call this bearing witness to, because we had some problems. But talk to the, our, our viewing and listening audience about why this exhibit is so important. Well, this exhibit is a fun, for me personally, I came of age in the 60s. So it's, it's my period, but it's also a link in time between the history of the black struggle for freedom from slavery, uh, through Jim Crow, through the civil rights movement. It's a historic moment of a decade in time when black leaders, white leaders, men, women, old and young join hands to say no more will we have segregated public facilities for education, for eating, for housing, and took a, a bold stand that really was the prelude to Black Lives Matter. And interestingly, this exhibit was not my idea. I was, uh, I had a call a few years ago from my old friend Gilles Morat, who's the leading authority on photography in France. His next exhibit will be on the photographs of Eudora Welty, which are in your archive. But Gilles said, I want to do an exhibit. He directs the finest photography museum in France, the uh, Pavillon Populaire, which is a historic two-story building in Montpellier, France. And we filled every room in that museum. And over 50 people joined me at the opening in 2018, including Doris Derby, uh, whose work is prominently featured in it, and James Meredith and his wife, Judy. Uh, so it, it was a historic moment for all of us. And that exhibit tries to showcase both the famous photographers like Danny Lyon and those who are largely unknown outside of communities where they took photographs for the local newspaper. And it tracks 
the decade of the 60s, uh, from the beginning to the end. And it was my privilege at the end of that decade to begin my teaching career at Jackson State University, where I met uh, Doris Derby. I lived on Gaim Street, two doors up from the Medgar Evers home and a few doors down from the home of my dear friend, Margaret Walker. And Margaret and I taught in the English department together and worked on projects over the years. And I now serve with great pride on the Margaret Walker board uh, of her foundation. So the decade of the 60s was a seminal moment. And photographs are so important in capturing what I think of as memory and sense of place. Whether the moment is James Meredith's arrival as the first black student at the University of Mississippi or the uh, mule train uh, that left Marks, Mississippi and uh, carried uh, civil rights leaders uh, to Washington, D.C. Uh, all of those moments during the 60s, tragically ending with Reverend King's death and with the death of two students, uh, Gibbs and Green at Jackson State, are captured in these photographs, which are powerfully rendered images of struggle often in very dangerous moments, photographers were there with their cameras and they locked down for the rest of history that decade. And the photograph has been a vehicle for freedom and uh, opposition from slavery to the present for black people. In the 19th century, Frederick Douglass wrote and spoke about photography, which he saw as the way of dignifying the black face and giving it a kind of uh, profile that it had never received. And Douglass was the most photographed face in the 19th century, more than Abraham Lincoln. And then we come to the 50s with the murder of Emmett Till, whose mother, Mamie Till, insisted that his casket be left open in, during the service in Chicago, as she said, so they can see what they'd done to my boy. That photograph launched the civil rights movement. So when Groups like SNCC in the 60s began to build an audience for what they were doing with civil rights. They turned to the photographer Danny Lyon and to Doris Derby to capture these events on film that they then used for posters. So these photographs are so powerful they represent a link with how photography has always been important right to the present with Black Lives Matter. Uh, so this uh, exhibit is really a historic moment and it's especially important for Mississippi because we have leaders like Doris Derby and James Meredith still thankfully with us and their voices are so very important. They really are living legends. You know, Dr. Derby, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Ferris, I'm thinking about Dr. Derby. If you would talk to us about the photographers and how they felt, we, we talked the last time about Danny Lyons and how he felt when he came into Jackson, Mississippi. Yes. Well, Danny Lyons wrote about coming to Jackson for the first time. He was not a Southerner. And 
So it was the first experience. And he said, it was like my memory of coming to South Africa. It was a totally foreign and frightening experience. And he was arriving at the airport and going to the SNCC uh, headquarters in a black neighborhood. He immediately had a problem because white taxi drivers wouldn't take him there and black taxi drivers were afraid to carry a white person into the black neighborhood. But finally, he got a taxi driver who was black, who took him to his address, which turned out to be the wrong address, the, <laughs> but they told him that the SNCC house was right next door. Uh, but you also had Southern uh, photographers uh, like Spider Martin in Alabama, who had a, a price on his head. Governor uh, Wallace said, get Spider Martin. He's got too many photographs out there. And so he was photographing a protest in Alabama. And there were lots of uh, heavily armed police. And it was in a black neighborhood and it was getting very difficult. And this lady in front of whose house he was photographing said, you better get in here before you get hurt. And he came in and he said, she told him now sit down and eat some food. And she had dinner ready. He said it was collard greens and cornbread and he had a good meal. And then he said, I gotta get back out there. She says, no, you've got to have some banana pudding. <laughs> and he said he looked outside the door at this heavily armed policeman. He said, I think I'll have that banana pudding too. <laughs> but there are all these moments. Uh, Ernest Withers was photographing a march in Jackson when a policeman knocked him and his camera to the ground. Uh, so you have white and black Southern and Northern uh, photographers all engaged in this uh, epic decade and all of whose work is featured. And they're from all over the South. They're covering everything from Washington, D.C. Uh, to Mississippi. It's a, a very moving experience. And in France, over 40,000 people it was a record attendance over three months came to see this show. And the children in the schools are still using these photographs as part of how they learn about civil rights. So it, it, it's had a ripple effect. And when this show ends for the next five years, it will travel all over this nation as well. But you are launching it as well, you should. And Lonnie Bunch, who is now the first black historian to be secretary of the Smithsonian, did the foreword in a very moving piece about his memory of that period as a young black student. Uh, the whole thing is a feast of, of beautiful memory and courageous uh, photographers and protest leaders from Dr. King to a woman registering to vote in Greenville, Mississippi, who is 105 years old. She was a slave. And here in the 60s, she registers to vote. Uh, what could be more beautiful? And we're going to talk about those photographs in just a second. But just one more question. You know, we talk about the photographers, and these were unassuming people just in crowds, but they documented this history that we're looking at now. It had to be so uh, scary for them, and they're like hero, heroes and sheroes for us when we look at these photographs. Yes. You know, uh, my friend John Dittmer wrote a classic history of civil rights based on his work in Mississippi called Local People. And that's what this photography show really focuses on, the unknown, unknown photographers, 
but also just local people who said, as Fannie Lou Hamer said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I want to be able to eat where I would like to eat, to study where I want to study, uh, and to live where I want to live. And thanks to those courageous voices, those segregated walls have fallen. And we're, as Governor Winter said, we're halfway home and a long way to go. We still have a journey ahead, but the 60s laid the foundation for making that trip possible. How phenomenal. We're gonna go into these photographs and talk a little bit about them. You talked about the young lady who was 105 years old and she was a former slave. And this photograph by Bruce Hilton is just so amazing. Can you talk to us about this? Yes, Bruce Hilton is probably the least known of all the photographers in the show. We had a hard time finding who took this photograph, but we finally identified it as Bruce Hilton's. Bruce Hilton was not really a photographer. He was a minister who came to Greenville and who worked with Owen Brooks, who was head of the Delta ministry. And he snapped a few photographs of which we felt this one had to be in the exhibit. And, and you said a name that is truly dear to my heart, Owen Brooks. That man is, was so <laughs> yes. awesome, and he taught me so much. So uh, truly, this is truly dedicated to Owen Brooks and all the people that helped with the Civil Rights Movement. The next photograph is by Don Sir Sturkey. And this one says so much to me when I see this yeah. photograph. It's, it's just these strong women who are passing by, not with their heads down. Talk to yes. us a little bit about this one. Well, Don Sturkey was a photographer for the Charlotte Observer. And his work on Klan photographs is just frighteningly powerful. Uh, and this photograph is in Salisbury, North Carolina, not too far from Charlotte. And it's a picture of three black women walking down the street past Klansmen in outfits and other whites. Uh, it's a shocking reminder of how the Klan felt at liberty not just at night, but during the day to walk along, but also the courage of these black women who are not intimidated and who, as you said, held their heads high and walked on by. Uh, but this is the 1960s. It's not long ago. No, it's not. It's not long ago. I think the, ex the expression on the second woman's face says it all. Yes. Yes, it does. <clears throat> It does. This really is a family affair. And we don't know these people personally, but we feel like they are ancestral voices who open doors for us with the courage of taking those steps they took at that moment. It truly is. The next one is a Spider Martin photograph. And I remember going through the Civil Rights Museum with John Lewis, the Honorable John Lewis, and he shed tears because he remembered all the people that marched with him. So talk to us about this photograph. Well, this is an example of the courage of photographers who were in the midst of the violence that occurred. And this is uh, near the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, and Congressman Lewis, a young civil rights leader on the ground is being beaten. And Spider Martin in 1965 was there to capture it. Martin was nicknamed Spider because he could do anything to get a good photograph. Sometimes he climbed into trees to get above the action and photograph down. 
But his photography uh, was legendary in its period, and Governor uh, Wallace singled him out and told the police, if you can get Spider Martin, do it, because his photographs are too widely seen. Uh, they were becoming a problem for the image of Alabama, as were all of these photographers. Through their photographs, they let the world see what was happening, the violence and the strife that was underway in the South. Uh, it's a, it's a powerful example, but you feel as though you're about to be hit when you see this. Okay. You, you understand the fear. You also understand the dignity of Congressman Lewis and others who dressed in a coat and tie as if they were going to church. And he carried on his back a little knapsack with an apple and a book because he knew he would be arrested. And he took a bite to eat and a book to read uh, to keep him company. That's what you see in these photographs, which are timeless. And it is timeless. The next photograph is by Art Shea, and this is here at the University of Mississippi. Yes, Art Shea was an amazing photographer who lived in Chicago and photographed all over the world millions of images of the Pope, of kings and queens, of Muhammad Ali. And he was sent on assignment south twice. The first was James Meredith's arrival at the University of Mississippi. The second was for the funeral uh, service of Reverend King. But this is in Oxford, Mississippi on the campus. This is a dormitory at the University of Mississippi in 1962. And hanging from the dorm in the back are a Confederate flag and an effigy of Meredith who's been hung from the pole hanging out. And there were thousands of military uh, police of, uh, that were brought out so that this one black man could enter a white university in 1962. Wow, wow. The next photograph is a photograph about health care. And, and if you talk to us a little bit about this one. Well, this is one of Doris Derby's beautiful photographs. And Doris had a gift for the intimate, quiet moments where women, children, people were doing things that were part of the movement, but were not like what we just saw on the Pettus Bridge. Here is Dr. Uh, Shirley, who grew up in Gluckstadt, Mississippi, and left the state to be educated and trained as a doctor at Meharry, and then came home uh, to take care of all ages because there, he was the only uh, black doctor in the state. And here during the 60s, he's caring for a child who's afraid, obviously, of what might be coming and his mother is sitting there beside him. But it's a beautiful, intimate moment of what was supporting the movement in the form of medical care. And Doris also photographed schools, freedom schools, and the garden and food programs that were developed as part of the civil rights movement while she was working as a photographer with SNCC. You know, we have to honor Dr. Britton and Dr. Robert Smith and Dr. Shirley, Dr. Anderson, and so many, of course, Dr. Barnes, Helen Barnes, and all of them, and I'm probably leaving someone out, but just all of the doctors who were a part and were there doing the movement and, and, and weren't afraid to go in and help the marchers who needed to be helped in regards to being looked after because they were hurt doing something, du during something that was happening, some event that was going on. 
Yes. The next photograph is a Dr. Doris Derby photograph, and this is the children protesting, and that's right here in Jackson. Yes. Uh, of all things to be segregated, the YMCA, a Christian organization. But someone once said the most, I think Dr. King said, the most segregated moment in America is 11 o'clock Sunday morning when people go to church. Of all the ironies that that moment where we worship before the same God, uh, but that has changed, thankfully, thanks to the 60s. Uh, and the churches are increasingly at the forefront of trying to move us forward in understanding and Black Lives Matter today are certainly indebted to these young children and to Doris for capturing that moment. And kudos to the parents who allowed their children to go out and march, because that was a, a time for you know parents to be afraid for their children, but they knew that putting the children out there would, would possibly help in some way. Well, we have to say that every movement, including the civil rights movement, is spearheaded by young people. Young people are not afraid they will follow their beliefs to the limit. We see that today with the young white and black uh, leaders in Black Lives Matter. We saw it then, uh, the SNCC freedom singers, uh, Reverend Ed King in Mississippi at Tougaloo, uh, black and white together uh, was the line from We Shall Overcome, it was also the line from Reverend King's I Have a Dream speech when he dreamed of when one day in the state of Mississippi, black and white children will play and study and be a part of a common uh, dream of the future. You said it so well. <laughs> the next photograph is an art shade photograph, and this is the yes. uh, viewing of, of Martin Luther King Jr. Yes, this was taken during the sanitation strike, which is where Reverend King came and gave his amazing uh, sermon about going to the mountain and then was murdered uh, in the Lorraine Hotel which is today part of the uh, National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. Uh, this photograph was taken in the R.S. Lewis Funeral Home in Memphis in 1968 by Art Shea, the photographer who traveled from his home in Memphis down and took incredibly powerful moving photographs of these worshipers expressing their grief as they walked by Reverend King's coffin. This last photograph that we'll show, it's, it's no words for it for me when I see it, but it's just so amazing. I see that the photographer is unknown, but if you'll speak to this photo. Well, uh, one of the amazing photographers in Memphis uh, is uh, Ernest Withers who, like uh, Art Shea, took several million photographs. Uh, he took all a manner of photographs on Beale Street of black and white musicians. Probably the most famous is of a young B.B. King and a young Elvis Presley together. Uh, he also photographed the black community in its full spectrum, but with special emphasis on civil rights. And his photographs of the sanitation strike where the protesting uh, marchers carried signs that said, I am a man, uh, became legendary. And that is the inspiration for this exhibit, which is called, I am a man. 
And the photograph on the cover of the book shows uh, perhaps a hundred protesters all holding the I am a man photograph uh, on a poster. Now the daughter of uh, Ernest Withers, Roz Withers, has a museum of her father's work in Memphis. And Roz was also at the opening of our exhibit uh, in France. And she told me, I knew Ernest Withers and I'm honored to know his daughter as well. And she spoke with me about uh, Merle Evers and her daughter visiting the museum and seeing the photographs that he took of Medgar Evers. Uh, his work is legendary. It's uh, all over the world in museums and in the homes of people. And this again gives you the immediacy. He's almost touching this bayoneted uh, rifle and the man who holds it and the unafraid marchers going by. Uh, in the background, there are tanks, but uh, as Reverend King and others believed, nonviolence and truth will prevail. And guns on both sides uh, have been beaten back by truth and the belief in civil rights. And that will always be the case. And this decade drew the line in the sand and said no more will we be considered boys, we will be men. And I remember Willie Morris, the writer from uh, Yazoo City visiting Richard Wright at his home in Paris. And Willie asked Mr. Wright, why do you live in Paris? And his answer was, because I want to be treated like a man. Mm -hmm. And this is where I had to come. Uh, thankfully, that has changed. And this civil rights decade of the 60s was a big part in making that change happen. Wow, to take us to travel and you know, take this journey of some, just some of the photographs is, is just so, so powerful. So thank you for that. Katie, if you have some questions that you'd yeah, like to ask. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll kick off with one question. Um, Bill, a lot of the photographs in this exhibit are of, of powerful, significant moments in history. Um, and, and their impact comes from that. Um, but in general, um, as a photographer yourself and a curator of, of photographs, um, you have an eye that, that uh, you know, why, why one photograph is powerful more than another. Uh, talk about that and, and how you look at photographs and how you look at uh, a scene that you might be photographing yourself. Well, I, I have to say that photography is part of all our lives. There's no one that doesn't have photographs in their home that that are part of their family. The sense of place and memory that photographs bring is profound. And in my case, I grew up in a home that was filled with photography, uh, photographs of family, and uh, they were very important. And then I began at the age of 12 to take photographs simply because it was a way of doing things that were important in my life. And on the farm, I photographed a black baptism. I photographed a Christmas dinner at my grandmother's home where I first was given a camera. And then when I was just beginning my work in photography and folklore, uh, Charlotte Capers invited me to come see the photographs of Eudora Welty. And I had never seen those before. And I was moved beyond words to see that body of work. I knew Eudora as a writer. And uh, 
our relationship with the archives goes way back. My grandparents were friends with Charlotte's parents and Charlotte Capers uh, was my aunt's student. My aunt Frances Ferris Hall taught uh, Charlotte when she was a senior in high school. So Charlotte was a close friend of our family. And when I did my work collecting folklore, she gave me a letter of introduction. And she said, if you get stopped by the police, <laughs> you pull this out and show it. And one of the great things Charlotte did was to introduce me to Patty Black, who is and was my soulmate. I worked with Patty on a, per, a project when I was at Jackson State called Mississippi Folk Voices. We did concerts at the old Capitol. And then Patty uh, had the first really major uh, exhibit on uh, black history and folklore working with Roland Freeman, whose work is in this show and worth long. Uh, and Patty basically took the uh, museum into the next sort of chapter by embracing black faces and culture within it. And I have followed and my grandfather, before I was born, we lived on a farm that at one point was the home of Colonel BLC Wales. And he founded the first Mississippi History Society in the 19th century and his home is still there. And when my grandparents and my grandfather was the first agronomist in Mississippi, all of his papers are at the archive. And when he retired and lived on the farm, the home where Wales had lived still had lots of his papers. And my grandfather copied all those and placed them at the archives with Charlotte. So, and that home is now under the supervision uh, of the archives as a national treasure. And when I was born, I'm going way back, <laughs> but my mother remembered a, an elderly man coming to the house who lived up the road and giving her one of Wales, a silver goblet that had been owned by Wales. And she said this man, whose name was Eugene Fulks, came in a rumpled old suit and recited a poem and gave her this cup, which she later gave to me and I then gave it to Patty. Uh, but our links to the archive are very personal and very deep. And this exhibit to me is about as good as it can be. When I see Pamela and you and the work you're doing to deliver these resources to school children all over Mississippi, I remember going to the archives, to the museum as a young child and seeing uh, the mummy that was so <laughs> frightening and all children wanted to see that mummy from Egypt, which turned out not to be a real mummy, but it didn't matter because we all went to the archives and the museum to learn about Mississippi. And when children today go and those who can't go can go virtually, uh, they learn about a whole different story, a much deeper and a much more inclusive story than we ever dreamed of. And the two of you are our next chapter and you are young, you're smart, and you understand all this technology and are moving our state <laughs> forward in ways that I just think are wonderful. I say congratulations to both of you. You've said so many wonderful things today, and that was really a great story. But, um, but what Pam and I will take away 
is that you called us young. And thank you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You are. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ferris, we have one question from uh, our, our viewing and listening audience. The question is, is Dr. Ferris familiar with the work of Chairman Reading or Joe Freeman, two women photographers? I am. I don't know their work as well, and I need to, to study it more. But I have, I've seen some of the photographs, and I would welcome a chance to, uh, to learn more. And if they will email me uh, at wferris at unc.edu, I would love to have a conversation and, and learn from whoever sent the question. The next question is, would you talk about the French public's reaction to the exhibit? What connections did they make to their own history? Well, the reaction of the French was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the most publicized event in the nation that year, in 2018. And I have a thick file, both digital and paper, of all of the uh, articles that came out. I have links to films on television. And many of the schools uh, adopted uh, curriculum that are now being used in France based on this exhibit. So it's not over, although the exhibit's no longer physically there. It's being used by school children and teachers in France in a very important way. So, uh, and as I said, Gilles Morat, who is an amazing photographer and scholar, uh, is now developing an exhibit at that same museum on the work of Eudora Welty. So the circle is unbroken. I think we may have one more question. <laughs> and this will be our last question that we'll ask. Were there kinds of photographs that black photographer, let me start over. Were there kinds of photographs that black photographers were able to capture that white photographer, photographers never could? That's a mouthful right there. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. It's a great question, great question. Uh, because we chose the photographs without knowing who took them usually. I mean, if they spoke to you like the cover photograph there, I mean, you cannot walk by and not stop and look at that. It just breaks your heart. Uh, I would say that I'm sure that black photographers went places whites could not. But if you were carrying a camera, you were in trouble, whether you were black or white, if there were police there, because they knew you were there to document and to share that news in a way that they didn't want to see happen. Uh, but certainly the message of the movement was black and white together. And this uh, exhibit clearly does that because we have both black and white photographers here, but Black Lives Matter has reminded us of the extra hurdles that black photographers had to go through to get their work uh, published, to get their work acknowledged in exhibits. And I'm working with more and more uh, black photographers, both old and young, who are breaking through that barrier. Uh, and so uh, there's no question that race matters. Black lives matter, but they matter also in terms of photographers who were able to get access to publishing and to exhibiting in ways that uh, blacks could not. And I take my hat off to Patty Black for giving a show to Roland Freeman at a time when, as a black photographer, he couldn't walk through the doors that others who were white could. 
who were privileged because of the color of their skin. Uh, but that's an interesting, complex, and important question. But when you look at a photograph, you really can't say who took it, black or white. Uh, and sometimes it's surprising uh, that the intimacy of photography, uh, like Eudora Welty, whose photographs of black women, like Ida McToy, uh, a, uh, a, a woman who delivered children, uh, a midwife, uh, a beautiful photograph of Ida McToy that she took, I have uh, behind me on the wall. There are two of Eudora's photographs there. Uh, and she took many very sensitive and beautiful photographs of black faces uh, when very few people would reach out with a camera as she did. So I, I think photography allows us, as Eudora did, to reach across the barriers of race and affirm a common humanity that the camera uh, it sees no race, it only <coughs> sees the humanity of the people we photograph. This has been so interesting. It's, it's been amazing. I think uh, Katie can say for herself that this is, this is what we needed uh, to be able to talk about this exhibition again and to let people know that we have the book, the catalog book, the coffee table book, I Am a Man with the photographs, all of the photographs in it. We have it in our, in our museum store. Any last parting words before we sign off, Katie? Thank you, Bill, for all you have done for this state and the nation and, and certainly for the Department of Archives and History, and it's been a lot of fun talking to you today. Well, I send congratulations to both of you, and whenever I can be of help, I'll be at your side. Thank you cool. so much. And, and, and thank you for allowing us to have these photographs again, as Katie said, but just to make sure that we have something that's documented, history that's documented, where children can come and see what happened in the 60s. That's just so, and just the history, it just is so much. It's so much for them to take in. We're doing a lot of virtual programs around this exhibition. So again, thank you so much. Just to thank do- Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And, and I think we have a little housekeeping before we close. I wanna give some, and I hope I'm looking in the right camera, <laughs> but, Upcoming events, Wednesday, March 3rd, at noon, History is Lunch, and it is called The Black Press in Mississippi. And then Saturday, March 6th, at 11 o'clock a.m., I Am a Man, Thoughts of Yesterday, with civil rights veteran Frank Figures and Hezekiah Watkins. And then Thursday, March 11th at noon, mini story series, Votes for Women, The Southern Story. And for a complete list, go to our mdah.ms.gov. And just to say again, the I Am A Man exhibition will be up until the middle of August. I think that's the 21st of August. So please come and see it. And we are free every Sunday from one to five, every Sunday from one to five. The museums are open again from Tuesday through Saturday from nine to five. And thank you so much for being a part of this.